Hello? Okay, can you guys? Hello, can you hear me, Charlie? Raj. Yes, I, I can hear you. You can. Okay, good. You can hear me well? Okay. Uh, you can hear me well, Raj? Yes. I'm using the new microphone. That's why I'm testing. I can it. hear you well. Charlie, how you doing? All right. Why are you recording it now? God, I meant to stop it. Welcome to the College of Complexes. My name is Tim. I'd like to welcome everybody on this illustrious night to the college. The first thing I want to tell you is that there are two rules. One is no personal attacks. And two, there is uh, and two, there is one is no personal attacks. And two is one pool at a time. We've got a new microphone in here with a uh, podcast, so I hope it works well. And I'd like to welcome everybody tonight to tonight's illustrious topic, which is escaping me right now. But our format is as follows. Climate change. First is uh, we'll have our speaker who will we'll have a brief announcements period. The second our speakers, and two of them will speak for a while. Then we'll have our infamous um, question and answer period, followed by our rebuttals. And tonight is an open microphone. Everyone fired the kind of speech. Why I think we need to stop climate change. Three keynote speakers from the Illinois team for passes in the earth bill. Well, everyone in the restaurant, please be quiet. Green Richard Stuckey and Merrill Greer in the media will speak for five to 10 minutes. All right, you guys, please quiet down a little bit. Well, each speak about their environment, their involvement in the environmental movement to start the discussion after which all its attendees are invited to comment on the topic. So without further ado, we'll get into our announcements period. And uh, I do believe Charlie scheduled a new speaker for September 29th, which is gonna be me. We're gonna be talking about artificial intelligence. Is your computer becoming self-aware and is it gonna take your job or will it be a faithful servant for humanity? All right, Charlie, we're gonna get you up next to uh, give us our, uh, infamous announcements running upcoming programs. All right. Welcome everyone to meeting number 3,711 of the College of Complexes, the playground for people who think. As always, I will give an advertisement for learning about upcoming programs. We maintain a Google email group as well as a meetup email group. No traffic except for announcements, one or two per week, so that you will keep informed as to our upcoming programs. It only takes less than a minute to subscribe. <laughs> Instructions on doing so are found at the center tab of our main website. Uh, as usual, I would like to request that everyone attending by Zoom put a red X on their microphone. Right now, a big red X on your microphone, at least during the presentation. And I also ask that those in attendance personally in the restaurant, please contain their comments because it is picked up on the microphones at least during the presentation. Please be courteous to our speakers during the presentation period. Thank you. Okay, Charlie. All right. Well, I, we don't, what, you want to say something? All right. Although I am not a capitalist, I will give advertisement for our upcoming programs. <laughs> We're continuing with our Earth Month series of speakers. Uh, tonight, obviously, we're going to be talking about climate change and the Earth Bill. Um, at least one, to not be one of those keynote speakers. I don't see two of the people yet. Anyhow, Richard Suki will begin with him. Okay, so that's tonight. 
uh, next week on April the 15th, our own Dan Weinberg will be talking about capitalist uh, corporate farming versus modern regenerative soil practices uh, regarding soil, the importance of soil. You got to have stuff to grow things in. And there's various ways of dealing with that. So very informative presentation. I look forward to as usual from our own Dan Weinberg. On April the 22nd, here's truly Charles Paydock. We'll be presenting my plan, Chuck's eco plan <coughs> for the use of cars in the country, in the entire nation. I don't have a name yet for my plan. So I'm just calling it Chuck's plan. But when it's fully implemented, <laughs> you can tell all your friends that you personally know Chuck. So that might be something of honor to you. Anyhow, no, I have put together a very unique plan, having been involved in transportation for quite a few years. And I'm covering the entire gamut of, of going from point A to point B within uh, the city and the nation. So. See you on the 22nd. Um, on April the 29th, Tim has just announced how uh, it was going to be topic will be AI, artificial intelligence. There's been some very significant advancements made in computer technology, uh, especially in the area of robotics, transhumanism. I was reading today about how a robot, robot fell in love, this girl robot fell in love. And also I saw an app where you can you can design a girlfriend. It's a lot better than a real one. If you're a loser, you can't get a girl. So you can get a uh, an artificial girlfriend. It actually might be better. Anyhow, should be an interesting topic on the 29th, very timely. timely. May the 6th, we're going to have our uh, special May Day speaker on some facet of organized labor movement or uh, socialism, what have you. I just put bids out to get a speaker. So we'll be updating that once we uh, confirm the speaker for that program. Transitioning into May 13th, I've heard the speech. It's a very good presentation from our satellite campus. But um, Marilyn's going to be talking about economic democracy. There's other forms of democracy, but she's using the term economic democracy. Come in here, what she has to say covers a lot of different areas. Pretty interesting presentation. Mm -hmm. On May the 20th, I see he's here this evening. Our own Jonathan. He wants to use the ICC International Criminal Court to arrest what he determines him and his pals, they think are criminals. So we'll find out what he has to say about putting these uh, nefarious guys in jail. And, all right, so it should be a good one. On May the 29th or 27th, uh, is presently open. So if you'd like to speak, uh, please notify me on the end. Now, one last thing I'd like to give an advertisement. We do have two archival sites. One is our lecture library of previous re recordings of previous programs. And we also maintain an archival list, I call it, of PowerPoint presentations and recommended films uh, from various sources, uh, free and online, that you might want to take a look at. All right, okay. that's it. Take it away. All right, Charlie, we got, got it. All right, hang on here. We got, uh, all right. I'm not sure who's speaking first tonight, but. Uh, Richard. Richard, that, that's you. Okay, Richard, come up here and uh, we'll uh, get you hooked up as best as possible. Yeah, we'll have our keynote speakers and then open it up uh, open microphone. Welcome, Richard. 
Let me get your uh, PDFs up and uh, all right, we'll uh, be ready in a minute here as soon as I get you. Uh... He might want to pick up that other microphone and speak using that one. We've got both of them up there, Charlie. Yeah, but it's better if he speaks into it. Yes, I know. You're you're fine. We got him. Just just make sure you speak loud. Right. Do. Right. And I'm trying to get the uh, get the uh, get your thing here now. What is your? Uh, I forgot what it's called here. Yeah, I. Wait a minute. No, I'll get it here. We'll get it here. But this one here. Okay, there we go. We'll just uh, open it up here and. Uh, there we go. Well, we can we can pull it up. All right. All right. We we're we're. Uh, yeah, I know that's what we're trying to do right now. Okay, there we go. Can you guys see this? Okay, we gotta get the shared screen. Okay, hang on here a second. We're getting um okay, and we're on Zoom now. Okay. As soon as we get it here, all set. You, Jake. Spotlight for everyone. Okay, go ahead and get started. Okay, good evening, everybody. I'm Rick Stuckey. A little louder. A uh, little louder. Gosh, okay. Um, I'm working with an organization called Save Our Illinois Land. And that's a little, little not for profit that we started uh, about six years ago deal with the oil pipeline issue coming into Illinois. And uh, that one fizzled out and the oil pipeline still hasn't come. And then we got involved with uh, uh, stopping the Dakota Access Pipeline from doubling its capacity. We're still working on that one. We're waiting for the judges to give us our second chance to be on that one. And while that one was quieting down, uh, we got wind of uh, a new threat to the climate, well, to Illinois at least, uh, coming in from carbon dioxide pipelines, uh, which I'll talk about in just a moment. Um, we've been fighting that one since about December last year, I guess it was. Um, the company we dealt with, the, the dealing with this called Navigator. The pipeline is called the Heartland Greenway Pipeline. And I'll show you where it comes from in just a moment. But it's bringing carbon dioxide from primarily ethanol plants all over the Midwest into Illinois to dump it here with the sewer for the ethanol industry. We can't hear you too well. Oh dear. Uh, you got to speak up, that's why. I'm getting pretty close to the microphone. Do you hear me better oh, now? Better. Is that better? Okay, that's the microphone. Yeah. Anyhow, so um, too loud. Just, 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 just right. speak. Yeah. Okay, anyhow, so these carbon dioxide pipelines are bringing in Carbon dioxide under very high pressure, 2,500 pounds per square inch almost, and uh, intend to bury it in Illinois because we just happen to have the best place to bury carbon dioxide in the country. We have a thing called the Mount Simon saline beds, which are 7,000 feet under, under a large part of Illinois. And uh, on top of them, there is a 500 foot thick a layer of shale, the Eau Claire. Uh, assignment of uh, uh, sands, no, uh, okay, shale beds, and in theory, those shale beds, if we can get it down, maybe. Um, uh, so, um, the question is, will it stay down there, and what risks are there in getting it down there? And you can see from the, uh, the sign up there, which is one that's put up by the um, uh, pipeline company. They warn you that carbon dioxide is there and it can be dangerous. It's not, don't, don't dig into this pipeline because it can be very, very much dangerous to your life. Um, let's go on to the next one. I wanted to show you here a little video. 
take a couple of minutes of a rupture of a carbon dioxide pipeline that was done on purpose in a test lab in England. And it was done primarily for the purpose of calibrating the computer models that are supposed to predict how a big explosion will happen. This is a, this is a relatively tiny explosion, 154 cubic meters of CO2, of liquid CO2. And they exploded it with a explosive charge into an eight inch pipeline. And with any luck, we'll see how bad it was. Uh, yeah, as soon as I get it down. Yeah. Okay. Is it that link? It's coming down directly from the internet, I think. Yeah, we'll get it. We'll get it. Okay. 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 Anyhow, you'll see this is a, this is a, a what looks like a very scary rupture of this pipeline. But bear in mind that it is only one twenty-six, I think it was, of the size of an actual rupture that happened a couple of years ago in Minnesota, no, Minneapolis, in, no, Milwaukee, no, in, where the hell was it? Um, Louisiana, anyhow, down there somewhere. It's got to take and, a minute. To and uh, I'll keep rip babbling while this comes up. Um, anyhow, this pipe, this rupture of the pipeline happened. The people who were nearest to it had no idea the pipeline was even there. Their first responders didn't know it was there, and nobody was equipped to deal with this thing. It was a mile away, mile and a half away from a little village called Satasia. And when this pipeline blew, fortunately at seven o'clock in the evening or thereabouts. Um, I'm gonna get it, go. I'm gonna pull it up in a second, okay? okay. Um, no one knew what was happening. They heard this big rumbling. They didn't they thought it might be a chlorine leak from their water treatment plant or something like that. But anyhow, people Silent. realized it was dangerous. No, I know what's going on. To get away, and they found that their cars wouldn't run. Either they started it off, they ran, and then they, they could just keep it out because the carbon dioxide, when it comes out of these ruptures, goes up in the air, first of all, with a big explosion. There's all the dirt off the pipeline, and it was something called running duck This is carbon dioxide pipeline. The experiment was conducted in the safe environment of the DMBGL sequences of such ruptures in terms of mass downfall, greater formation, and dense gas dispersion. The viewers should note that the extent of the visible plume does not necessarily represent the extent of the dense gas mass. <laughs> Please, I can't hear you. Pour oil out of it, and you then um, uh, get some CO2 out. You try and separate them, put the uh, oil, put the CO2 back down the hole again, and get more oil out. Uh, you you get about oil that, when it's burned, creates about three times as much CO2 as what you put down the hole to get it out. So it's not in any way a uh, a climate uh, positive thing. To do. Uh, but that's what most, if not all, all pump CO2. One exception is in Illinois, and it's a pipeline in Decatur, where ADM has uh, taken a lot of public money and has constructed a um, uh, capture system there that works pretty well. Um, it's captured about half a million tons a year of CO2. It was supposed to do a million, but they never got that good. So anyhow, half a million. 
and they pumped it all in one mile and put it underground near there. Now that's just the prototype for the, the, the capture process. And uh, now the government has passed something called the 45 Q. Uh, up there, that's, that's the, the, the line in the tax code, or the section of the tax code that covers this, and it pays anybody who wants to sequester CO2 from any source $85 a ton of CO2 sequestered. Now, um, these, most of these are one big one in Illinois called Prairie State, down near St. Louis. Create 12 million tons of CO2 a year all by itself. That would take a big pipeline just by itself to sequester that one. And they're working on it. Um, but the, the ones for the ethanol are really easy to build because the ethanol comes out of the sequestration, out of the fermentation process, almost pure, 99% pure, pure CO2. And the CO2 then is be dried. And then it can be pumped with very high pressure and moved down a pipeline and buried. That's the theory of it. But it takes an awful lot of energy, even for an ethanol plant, 6,000 horsepower worth of uh, motors, to uh, sequester that CO2, much more in some of the other bigger plants. And uh, those motors are not powered by renewable energy. So they put more CO2 in the air. So the net gain of putting CO2 down the hole is not very great, even from the best possible sources like ethanol plants. Uh, these 13 ethanol plants that are in this state, only a couple of them are going to be connected to pipelines that we know of, and the rest of them, who knows what they'll do. Some of them would take care of their own ethanol, their own, sorry, CO2, correct me, but it's uh, their own CO2, they will pump it down a well close to their own uh, ethanol plant. Uh, but most of us are planning on letting somebody else do the work and having a pipeline carry it down to the best places in the, in the state. Okay, let's go to the next slide there. This is the, this one shows you the Navigator Hartman Greenway Pipeline. You can see it starts way up in the north in Minnesota and uh, north and south Dakota and uh, Nebraska. The bulk of it comes from Iowa and then it brings it down to Illinois. Which be a better place to bury it. There's only one uh, plant in, in Illinois that's connected to that. It's it was um, and it's a very really small ethanol plant in, in Illinois. Um, the navigator people applied as in last year. They withdrew their application in you know, January. Wasn't really complete. They came back in the end of February with another application. That added an additional line with polys needs on that one that goes into Montgomery County, just south of um, uh, Springfield. They they had to withdraw it because they didn't have a sequestration location, so it was essentially a pipeline to nowhere. And the Illinois Commerce Commission said they could be all go to, so they came back with a partial solution. A couple of landowners down in the Montgomery County area who said they'll take the CO2, but they don't have anything like the 24,000 acres worth of land it takes to build a sequestration well. So there's still, we think, a pipeline to nowhere, and we put in another application to dismiss them. We created a, a new organization called the Citizens Against Carbon Greenway Pipeline, specifically to work in the Illinois Commerce Commission to oppose the pipeline. It has 175 or so members who all contribute to the cost of doing this. A very, very excellent attorney who's who's running the uh, uh, the or the legal side of this. Uh, these these pipelines have work under a law that says they have to get approved or be rejected within an 11 month time frame, which is an amazingly fast time frame for someone like the Illinois Commerce Commission to work with. They, they come back uh, with a modified pipeline, and we'll see how that happens. Meanwhile, another one, uh, let's go to the next slide, please. Okay. Uh, you would think for something as dangerous as this, that there will be um, national regulation. There is a, uh, normally for hazardous pipelines and oil and gas pipelines, the, an organization called the Pipeline Hazardous Material Administration, Safety Administration, has 
very detailed regulations on things like how thick the pipe can be, how deep you bury it underground, what kind of lining it has to have, what kind of steel you have to use, what kind of you can put into it, and all sorts of things like the construction processes, the welding processes, are all covered by regulation. But there are essentially no regulations for carbon. They started thinking about doing some about five years ago, maybe more, and the industry said, oh, don't bother, there's only so few of them, doesn't matter, don't, don't worry, we'll take care of it. Uh, then the Sartatia explosion in Mississippi happened, and the pipeline guys came down to look at it, and they said, oh my God, this is awful. If this happens now, with more of these pipelines coming out, we're in deep trouble, so we better start writing regulations. But the regulations will take two years to write. In the meantime, there's only a limited amount of regulation for a limited section of the pipelines where the gas is at a high pressure and high temperature, 80 degrees Fahrenheit or above. And that only applies when it's just been compressed. As soon as it gets into a, a pipeline underground, it will go down to ground temperature about 55. And there is no longer what they call supercritical. And therefore, it's no longer covered by the regulations that PIMSA has put out. So they're furiously writing new regulations, furiously as an, as an administrative agency does. And it'll take the two years to do it. And um, in the meantime, essentially, these pipelines are on their own to design their own things with no standards and um, no regulations. And of course, they're going to do it in the cheapest possible way they can do. And they'll get their, their steel from the cheapest place they can buy it. And, uh, probably won't be in this country, and who knows what the quality is going to be like, but anyhow, uh, PIMS will eventually come across. In the meantime, because of this, this lack of regulation, and because of a whole lot of opposition from farmers who don't want these pipelines coming up and digging up their fields and leaving them open for months on end until they've got the whole pipeline built and pressure tested and so on, um, the several of these uh, counties and uh, municipalities and townships have already uh, adopted resolutions that say, hold off, wait for the two-year regulations and so on. And uh, uh, those, uh, those regulations, some of them say, you cannot put this pipeline within, let's say, a mile of a residence. Um, and uh, that isn't enough. It's probably all they could get away with. You put any more than a mile, a mile and a half in, and it gets really difficult to put a pipeline even through a rural place like Illinois and keep it away from people. We don't have to be done even at a mile. Um, anyhow, those are all for doing the navigator pipeline, which came first. Then we started getting into the, the next pipeline was coming, which is called the Wolf, Wolf and ADM pipeline. Uh, Wolf, ADM is the, one of the biggest. Um, of agricultural produce in the country, not the biggest one. They do all sorts of things, um, many of them in Illinois. Uh, they, have, they buy corn from the growers, they dry it, they grind it up, and ethanol out of it in, the, in one big plant in Decatur, and uh, a small one that they operate in uh, uh, Cedar Rapids up there. And another one, I forget what the name of that little town is over there, where that red spike goes up in Iowa, in Iowa, just across the river. Then they bring it into Illinois, and they go down towards the, uh, towards um, Peoria. Peoria is a, uh, a, a, a exceptional this exceptional thing there because the, the plant in Peoria is no longer owned by ADM it was or BioUrger, and it's right in the middle of the city. Uh, it was originally a whiskey distillery, and uh, after a while, when Illinois whiskey wasn't as popular as maybe other places, they went out of business and turned it into an ethanol plant. But it's right in the middle of the city, and next slide should show that, I think, uh, Kim. Getting there? Okay. Uh, anyhow, and this is there, that red dot in the middle is the bioallergic plant. It's alongside the river there, and you can see on the left of it there, there are a large number of houses, streets and houses, and those are primarily minority and uh, poor areas. So here's this pipe, this uh, uh, processing center, which is going to start compressing the CO2 to high pressures, 
and, and pipe it down a railroad track, which is the one you see going down diagonally towards the left of the screen there. It will run right alongside the railway tracks for a while, uh, and then into some other parts of the populated area. And we, we're working with some of the um, uh, local organizations there who, are deal, who deal with it. They've been worried about this plant for a long time because it's had its own explosion even before CO2 capture there. It was not very well run necessarily. And uh, they've been trying to get rid of it. And now we're working with them to try and move the plant out at least somewhere a bit safer. It's only an 8 inch pipeline. We think maybe a six inch there, but uh, it could still be a, a major uh, mass casualty if it does rupture. Okay, next one, Charlie. Okay, so um, what can we do? This, um, oh, I think on the right, on the on the previous slide was the, the discussion of the the bill in the, in the there. I think it's the slide somewhere. Um, we have a bill in Springfield. Uh, it's called HB three one one nine, and it's designed to address all of the things in Illinois that haven't been covered by laws that have to do with um, CO2 pipelines. So it deals with the capture process, which if you were, uh, for example, the Prairie State um, uh, power station would be very, very energy intrusive. It would be um, produce a lot of um, additional pollution. I won't go into why, but when you, when you start capturing things, you need more energy and then more energy coming out of that same power station creates more pollution, more particulates, and more CO2 and SO2. And um, it takes a ton of water they don't have in that part of the country. And it creates a great deal of not toxic waste from A mines and the like, which they use to capture the CO2. So um, we're trying to deal with the capture process. We aren't allowed to do much with the pipeline process because of this PIMSA regulation. This is a state, the federal government has exclusive rights to deal with this design of the pipeline and then do safety. But we can do things like um, setbacks. And we're planning on uh, a, a minimum one mile setback, a two mile setback for a hospital or a school, and a four mile setback for a town so that the town could expand to two miles and then still be two miles away from the pipeline. So um, that's, our, that's part of our proposal. Um, we do also deal with, um, uh, uh, in that case, eminent domain. Can you use eminent domain for a pipeline like this, which is entirely for private profit? It's not really serving the uh, community in any meaningful way, uh, but it is um, uh, it's for the profit of a couple of uh, venture capitalists and uh, you know uh, venture funds and so on will make all the money and the farmers will get some of it. So that bill does that part, and it also deals with the unknowns to do with the um, sequestration process where you uh, uh, have, don't have the rights to sequester at the present moment. The landowners don't have rights. Uh, we don't make the landowners responsible for the well, owners of the cause where the sequestration occurs and um, uh, uh, refuse to allow eminent domain or any forced way of taking the um, uh, their private land for the sequestration. Anyhow, that I think is, we're asking you now if you wouldn't mind to, um, um, let's see, I think what happened, oh, I see what happened. The slide you've got there talked about a moratorium bill, and that one actually didn't pass. Uh, but the, the other one called 3119 did pass uh, as far as a, a uh, subject matter hearing, which will take place sometime in the next month in Springfield, where we compare our bill, this one, 3119, with uh, HB 2202, which is an industry-provided business bill which does just exactly what you expect an industry bill to do. So if we get to use everything for free and you get all the risk, and as soon as this is done, down in the hole, the state owns it, and anything goes wrong, it's the state's problem. Typically, we pay them to subsidize it, put it down, and then we get paid to take all the risk when it's uh, been down there. So not a good deal. If you can do, send a letter to your um, congressman in uh, your representative in Springfield and your, your senator there, because this is going to be big, big news in the next month. So yeah, that's my, uh, my story on the CO2 so pipeline. Is it really helping? Uh, it's one of these many fake exercises to that supposedly 
are going to address climate change. But in fact, they're nothing more than greenwashing because they, um, if you wanted to really stop CO2 getting out, you wouldn't do this because so much energy is wasted on, on the compression and the cleanups and the pumping and so on. If you really wanted to reduce CO2, you'd look at the rest of the ethanol plant and say, let's take the Picado one as an example. It produces 4.3 million tons of CO2 a year, and the sequestration effort only touches 500,000 tons a year. If you really wanted to deal with the problem, you'd work on the coal-fired power station, which supplies the ethanol plant and the natural gas, which supplies it as well, and you'd, you'd substitute those for renewable energy, clean energy, and then you um, you save you know four and a half million tons instead of half a million tons. You wouldn't need a pipeline. So um, that's what ought to be done, but unfortunately, it isn't what's been done. Okay, I've taken far too much time, and uh, uh, I think we've got somebody else ready to talk, haven't we? Okay, uh, oh, well, Charlie, do we have anybody else online ready to go? I have a question. Oh, oh, oh. I have a well, question. Well, it's got a few questions, Tim. Okay. Okay, we'll go, we'll go to some questions. All right, Dan, go ahead. All right, so my question is, my question is, my question is, where is all this CO2 coming from? And wh why are we just hearing about it now and not 50 years ago? Good question. Well, let, let's deal Thank with you. the CO2 and the pipelines, first of all. They've been making, making uh, ethanol in these plants since about 2005, when a ridiculous law called the um, Renewable Energy um, Standard was imposed on the cars which said you've got to have 10% ethanol in all gasoline and diesel because it's going to clean up the exhaust from the cars, it's going to reduce our demand for foreign oil, and it's going to be a help for the farmers. Well, the first one uh, didn't really work. It does clean up the uh, exhaust from the car, but it produces other things which are even worse, like nitrogen oxide, because it burns hotter. So that didn't work very well. Um, as far as uh, reducing our demand for foreign fuel, that didn't work either because at the same time this happened, the whole fracking revolution took place and we had an abundance of oil to the point we've become the largest exporter of oil in the world. So we don't need it to give us energy um, security. What we need is more renewable power. And the third thing, the farmers, yeah, they love it. Half the arable land in the Midwest is devoted to growing corn in order to grow ethanol. But they, all this time that they've been growing this making the, growing this corn and putting it in ethanol plants, they've been exhausting all the CO2 into the air. And because most of the ethanol plants were in existence before the law was passed, um, they're, they're grandfathered. So they have no obligation to do anything about their CO2. So uh, it, it's just been quietly exhausted in the, in the farmland and uh, been going on for a long time. Now, with Paris and everything else, we decide, we're recognizing we've got to do something about this. And rather than do the right thing, which is to, cut, to work on the big problems, they're working on the easy one because the government's going to bribe them to capture the CO2 used in the ethanol. It's easy to do. It will make them $60 a ton. It's 500,000 tons coming out of just one small plant. So a lot of money in there. It's a gold rush. All these companies are trying to sign up the ethanol plants so they can get this cheap carbon dioxide and uh, make a lot of money on it. So it's not as easy as they thought it was going to be because these pipelines, these big ones we're putting in now are very different from the ones they've been using for enhanced oil recovery. Those are point to point. You can, you've got as much as you want coming out of the, uh, volcano, uh, the volcanic dome there, and you can turn it on and off whenever you want to, keep pressure up and so on. And uh, they're easy to run, they're single point. These ones are about 20 or 30 intermittent places producing ethanol, and keeping the pressure stuff is going to be really hard in these, in these new pipelines. Okay, I hope that answers the question. All right. There. Because from what I understand, renewables aren't going to really cut it for power. Well, uh, there's, a, there's a lot of argument about that. If you talk to a guy called Mark Jacobson from Stanford, he has a complete book and a plan on how you could replace 
all the coal and oil power, the coal and uh, natural gas power stations in a hurry. And that, that would be the best thing to do is to, is to just go, go hog wild on putting in renewables and use those to displace the places that are creating millions of tons of CO2 per location. Uh, and where, it, where you don't really need them to do that anymore because we've got better solutions. So that's the way to do it, is to go for the things that you can do. And Mary, if Mary's online, she'll talk about three things that you can do uh, that will be, be the biggest possible impact by 2030 in reducing CO2. Is Mary there? Because I'd like to- I don't more. know, I, I don't see her online. Oh dear. Okay, I may, I may end up doing that part as well. Well, why don't you uh, go ahead and start doing well, that? We have another question in the back there. A couple okay. more questions. Why don't we have one and I go next and then we go back to Richard. What was that? Let me go now to you, Richard, and then we'll see if Mary's here or else we'll go back to you. Okay. All right, Charlie, if you're presenting next, go ahead. You got the, you got the screen. All right. I... Uh, we did on the advertise this as a review of the Earth Bill, uh, which we've already had a program on, but it was basically about a year ago, but at least. So as a refresher, may perhaps everyone is not familiar exactly what it is we are discussing here as advocates of the Earth Bill. Now, when I deal with Congress, I generally, as a rule, only advocate legislation that has been introduced. And you can uh, be familiar with this when you see the nomenclature HR and a number or Senate uh, 100 or something. Uh, otherwise, you're advocating that they kind of think about creating legislation, which is an onerous activity. If that's very generic uh, and wide open. So I prefer to advocate only for legislation that has in fact been introduced because you're significantly uh, on, in progress at that point. That's why it's singularly important. Now the Earth Bill has been given, introduced, and it has a number. It is HR 598. And they're currently attempting to secure co-sponsors among the members of Congress. Now, why do we have an Earth Bill? Now, all of us be prior to this, and I gave a lecture on this, uh, we're all familiar with the Green New Deal. The Green Party had one. There's been other variations of this over time, various plans for curbing uh, global warming, climate change. Anyhow, um, the Green New Deal was not a specific piece of legislation. It was a resolution that the government should pursue environmental policies. So in that sense, it really didn't affect any specific change. This is where the Earth Bill comes along and achieves that. Now, where did the Earth Bill come from? And the process was to take about a dozen different plans, such as the Green New Deal and the Green Parties and other personages out there, organizations uh, with a vested interest in bringing about climate change. Uh, and an effort was made to consolidate the best practices, as they call it, the best practices of those that were being pursued and incorporate them into one piece of legislation. Now, the time frame for this legislation cannot be stressed more so than anything else. If you go to the website of the Earth Bill, which I highly recommend, give it five or 10 minutes, that's all it will take. And you get it very easily summarized. You will see their video in which they have the climate clock is ticking. And we have about five years 
or basically until 2030 uh, to really do something to bring the temperature within 1.5 or 2 degrees Celsius. The specific name of title of the Earth Bill is an Earth Lack to uh, uh, Counter Pollution by 2030, the Earth Act. Um, it focuses, we even went one step further and reduced it down to three specific areas, specifically energy, uh, transportation, and agriculture, since these are the principal contributors to climate change. Now, there's one thing I've got to explain about the legislative process, if you are not familiar with this. And is that Congress will pass a law. The laws are written very generically. If you read them, there is not much detail. And they are enabling legislation. Now, the other thing about legislation, specific and particularly legislation such as this, is that we'll have to go through the committee process. There will be numerous significant additions, deletions, and revisions, pen and ink changes to the document prior to any sort of passage that would even be considered. So what you see is, is, is a step, they Chinese say, a journey of a thousand miles begins with one step. Now we're a little bit further ahead of that, fortunately, through the efforts of those in the ecological community who have advanced this. We certainly propose advance any other sort of legislation at the federal, state, or local level that achieves the same goals. There's a myriad of things. And the Earth Bill is not an omnibus act, meaning it's an effort somewhat like the Green New Deal, which is wide sweeping in its, its language. Uh, it's a study, basically a study on what we should do uh, in, in all areas. So the Earth Bill is a bit more focused. Um, the, the, uh, nevertheless, that's the nutshell of it. Uh, we do form statewide teams and you are basically encouraged to adapt your district and see to it that um, your legislator, legislative elected officials get behind this piece of legislation. You can do so by signing up at the website. The Illinois committee has meetings, uh, I think once or twice a month, but you're welcome to join. Uh, efforts in that regard. There are also coalitions of other groups. Uh, there's one that is comprised of religious environmentalists. Uh, and I'm not aware of the others, but any other groups that get together with the common interest, uh, they're looking now to put one on as employees and organized labor. Uh, to deal with climate change. So get involved. This is a good time to get started and involved in it. There's a good chance. And I extend, personally extend an invitation to each and every one of you, if not behind the earth bill, to do something at least so that we do not have a, a catastrophe. The tipping points are showing, are going up every day. There's alarming reports of the tipping points regarding the onset of climate change, which will not be reversible. All right, Tim, let's get Rich there back and he can give us a little more insight of what's going on. Is there anybody in attendance? Earth to college complexes. We lost your last 20 seconds, Charlie, because of the internet connection. Anyway, I just was inviting everyone 
to get involved in the Earth Bill or to pursue their own initiatives if they so choose. But we extend an invitation to each and every one of you to go to the website, sign up, and we'll take it away from there. Okay, I, do you wanna do that second part of that presentation? Are you ready to do that? Uh, Mary's part. Mary's part. Is Mary not online? No, she's not online yet, no. Uh, I don't see them online. I'm gonna remove the spotlight here. Uh, we got Stephanie Belenko, Jake, Janice. Uh, nobody's nobody. No, that, that that's everybody who's here. It's just because it's denied. So they're not here. So are okay. you ready to? Uh, um, well, okay. I can. I'll do another topic on YouTube. Okay. Yeah. Go ahead and do it. Yeah. yeah sounds good. Let's go. Go ahead. Okay. Do your part on nuclear. Do your part on nuclear. Okay, yeah, but, first of all, any you had a couple of questions in the back on CO2. Um, I, I to ask them, it make any difference that uh, double hull. Um, they never build a double hull, as far as I know. They they, they do have a thing called a high consequence area, where they it's, it's where there's it's close to people, and they do make the pipeline a lot thicker. Um, but I, I don't. I don't think you've ever seen like a double hold, like a double hold boat. Uh, it's just a single hold. Okay. And there's another one more question from the back there. Yep. Yeah. You said it, it wasn't required everywhere though until 2005. Was it? Yeah. Yeah. Correct. It yeah. was it Rose who was uh, trying to. We started putting ethanol in the gas in 1970. Nebraska did it in the 40s. Okay. And. We've been synonymous for a very long time. And it sure doesn't hurt that ADM being the big headquarters in the dictator. Yeah. No, you're, you're absolutely right. I, I was just thinking that the, the real big push went nationwide. 2005. So we became the ethanol supplier for basically the whole country at that point because uh, we were already in business for it. So that's when it really grew and became became big and became subsidized by the federal government there. Yeah, but it's been around here for a very long time. Okay, I grant you that. One more question there. Okay, Jonathan, and then we'll go to Ellen. Ellen. Jonathan uh, first. Uh, well, Jonathan. Please repeat the questions. Okay, I'll, I'll repeat the question. Okay, the question is: if if this core, if this land was not being used to grow corn specifically for ethanol, and that is a different kind of corn than food corn, uh, what would you do with it? It's a good question. Um, first of all, it wouldn't it wouldn't be an instantaneous cut off. It would be over a course of a number of years. We have to find other things to do. With that, I don't know what they would be, but we'd have to do something there. There was a lot of land that was put into ethanol production because it's been so profitable that probably shouldn't have been used for that. And it's marginal land that requires a lot of fertilizer and irrigation and things like that. So first of all, we'd probably take some of that out of production, at least out of arable production, and free up that for other, other purposes. But we would have to find something else for the farmers to do. Good question, Ellen? Yeah. I just wanted to get more of your background on the history. It, it sounds like these are kind of cap and trade and business and you want one of these? No, thank you. I don't I'm gonna go for a go for a walk or something. Okay. Where did you come into this? Okay, I came into this very late. Um really until navigator. Uh with navigator and one called summit. There are some it goes from the same areas all the way through Midwest, all the way up to North Dakota, where it's definitely going to be used for in hard soil recovery. Uh, so that was the first one that happened. We weren't very much aware of that because it wasn't coming to Illinois. Then Navigator came out. Um, was it towards the September last year or something like that with the first announcements? And they were talking. They were doing land. They were doing uh, um, public announcements up and down the pipeline where it's going to be. That's when we got 
aware of it. And it was at the same time that all the killer access stuff was winding down. And we said, hey, this is a big threat. You ought to do something about it. And my group is basically in it in Chicago. And we found we couldn't do a whole lot from here. So we've been providing money for it mainly. There were a number of uh, fairly substantial grants that were used to help fund the operation down there. We started this coalition, which is us and Sierra Club and uh, a couple of faith organizations, and, you know, a dozen or so different organizations that um, decided this is serious. And they are based in the, in the center of the state around uh, everywhere from Hancock County down to uh, Sangamon County, where Springfield is, and up to Christian County, which is where they originally were going to sequester it. So that's where this the core group of hard workers are working down there. You're trying to stop it, right? You're we're, trying we're, to... we're trying to stop it because we don't think it's a good use of money and because of a huge amount of opposition from the farming community. They really love their land down there. You know, they've yeah. been in they've been in their land in their in their families for hundreds of years in some cases, and they're they're a different breed. And I, I'm a farmer originally, but my farm is lots more than those ones down there. Um, and but I mean they, they they really don't want this to come into their land, and that's what got us going. And then we when we had this explosion down in Cetacea, we realized oh this stuff's dangerous. This is really dangerous, and there's no regulations on it. So we've got to fix the regulation part before we start building lots of these things that are going to blow up. And, uh, you know, regular pipelines are uh, no restriction from the federal government on how close they can be to a house. All, the only rule that's in terms of that is that if you're going to put it within 50 feet of a house, you can put another foot of dirt on top of it. And that's not very good, but it was, it was reasonably adequate for uh, oil pipelines. Because when they, they leak, you know, you usually get a little bit of leak first of all, you can uh, capture it. It doesn't do, uh, it hurts the ground, but it doesn't do a ton of damage to people. Natural gas is a bit worse, it goes poof and then it goes up rather than sideways. It doesn't spread very far. A thousand feet or so, you're, you're perfectly safe. For but these new ones, it's a mile or two miles, and uh, you know we don't really know how big the the, the um, navigator at twenty miles and twenty inches, forty five percent bigger than the Sartesia one, a little bit a mile and a half. You know, so we don't know how bad they are. We just know they're bad, and we're working on that. And it doesn't seem like it has much value, right? It's kind of it's kind of a it's, cap it's and a waste trade. Product. Um, yeah, it's a waste product. It's it's, 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 it's normally it's just in throw away and exhaust stuff in the end. No one wants it. It's a small amount that's used yeah. for breweries and uh, uh, so they use it for it's got no well, government money. The government, as soon as the government used eighty five dollars a ton, it used to be twenty dollars a ton. Is it cap and trade? Like All right. Next question. Understood. It is not. It is exported to Canada, a little bit exported to other countries, but it's primarily used within the country. Okay. What value? All right. All right. Trade? Next question. It's not really traded at all. It's only the ethanol is traded. Right. So it's it's the ethanol. Okay. Okay. The waste okay. All right, Charlie, you go ahead. Charlie, go ahead. Yeah, Richard. Um, yeah. Richard, don't you think? These, the environmental movement is getting a little overboard. They want to green the entire United States economy. Now, it's wonderful your project, but they seem to have their eyes on the prize. Well, they have their eyes just on the going a little bit too far. They have their eyes on the problem, Charlie, which is basically to say, you know, uh, the scientists, the hundreds of thousands, tens of thousands of Earth scientists around the country have said quite unequivocally and uh, been proven, been known to the uh, oil and gas companies for years that um, you've got to stop making CO2 or we're all going to die or fry. You know? And do you want to do that? You want to uh, burn uh, your kids to that sort of a problem? I'd like my kids not to have to live through six degrees higher temperatures than we've got now. And, uh, and that all the other consequential problems that will come when the temperature goes up. And the only way you can stop it is by stopping making the CO2 in the first place. It's a lot easier and a lot more effective to, can, to, to stop making it than to let it get up in the atmosphere and try and take it back again. Because it's very, very dilute in the atmosphere. It's in parts per million or billion in the atmosphere. And so the process of extracting it from the atmosphere after you let it out is enormously expensive. It creates more um, 
more pollution than it saves in most respects. And uh, even if you use entirely renewable energy to run your um, uh, capture process of your direct air capture, um, it still uh, puts out a lot of pollution uh, from the plants themselves. And it uses an enormous amount of energy to be much better off used to, to shut down a coal-fired power station or something like that. So we have to, to reduce the CO2 in the air. I think everybody knows that has to be done, but there's a lot of people fighting it because it's going to hurt. If they are dependent upon doing things that uh, put CO2 into the air, they want to keep on doing them because they've got big investments in it. But it's killing us, and we have to take action, and very quickly. And the bill that you talked about, Charlie, one of the key things about it is it's quick. That is, it's got a focus in the short term on 2030, and they picked the three areas where with the least effort and where the most known technology is there so they could get the biggest bang for the buck. And they chose electrification, maximum use of renewable energy, transportation, maximum use of electric and maybe hydrogen vehicles and so on, and renewable agriculture, generative agriculture, because it's only for the major agricultural industry players they want it, they're, they're doing that to build. Because again, there's a small number there, relatively speaking, if you can get them to do it, you get an awful lot of return in a quick hurry. So, you know, the, the, the one big benefit of the bill you talked about is the speed which it takes effect. So many of these other ones say, let's pollute now and try and capture it later on. And that just doesn't work. And there's no need for it, except to keep the existing industries in place. And, you know, it's time for a major change. The oil companies have known this for 20, 30 years. They just hid it from us and set up these fake uh, think tanks to hide it, and then just like the, the uh, tobacco industry, let's, let's create uncertainty and doubt about the, the climate change. Then people won't be convinced to do anything about it. We can keep on making the tobacco or making the cigarettes or we can keep on making the oil, and uh, we'll make a lot of money out of it. So that's, that's the basics, but it has to be done quickly. Okay. okay uh, I, Thank yeah. you. Some background on the, the pipeline. The Dakota Pipeline, what happened? Oh, the Dakota Access Pipeline. Yeah. Uh, the first Dakota Access Pipeline went in, uh, oh, I forget when it was, 2017, I think it was. And there was very, very little attention, very little fuss. One remarkable lady, Abitha, her last name, from the Shawnee Forest area, tried to take on the fossil fuel industry all by herself. And what she found out is you can't do it, you know. It, 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 you've got to be a lawyer to work with the ICC. Everything is written down in legalese, and you've got to know all the statutes. It's really difficult to do. And she tried to take it on single handedly. And they sabotaged her computer so she couldn't even file. And so, you know, she basically gave up, and, they, and the pipeline went through and got built. And then uh, a couple of years later, they came back and said, We're going to double the capacity of the pipeline because there's a little bit of more demand that we can handle. We produced the list of half a dozen uh, drillers in the Bakken area, North Dakota. And so we want to put oil down this pipeline, and they said, we haven't got room for them. So therefore, we're going to not just put enough room for those people. We're going to put double the capacity in there, so we've got room to spare once you're doing that. And they did it by just increasing the pressure in the pipeline putting in more pumping stations, two or more, in, 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 three or more, in, like, two, two new ones in one upgrade, and uh, pushing the pressure in the pipeline closer and closer to the maximum limit. And uh, we said that's, there's no benefit to Illinois. That was our key, key argument, no benefit to Illinois. And uh, we basically showed that in the hearing, but the ICC said, ah, oh, it's okay, let them do it anyhow. And so we appealed that one, and on a half a dozen different grounds to the appeals court, the uh, appeals court let us win on a couple of them, one of which was the most incredible one, which is it has to be a benefit for Illinois, and only because of something called the Dormant Commerce Clause, which is something you'll hear about just recently because it's involved in, this, in the abortion bill issue. You've never heard of it before, but it's a, uh, it says if it affects one other state, you've got you to consider it. And they said, you can only consider the rest of the country if, it, if it's the Norman Com Commerce Clause. And you must not consider export as a benefit to Illinois. 
and you must not take the um, the paperwork that the um, uh, the oil companies were put in there because those are self-serving. So it ruled out everything that the Illinois Commerce Commission has always done to justify these pipelines. And uh, uh, we took them to court on that, and we won on this on the on the issue of need. We took it back to the well, the court sent it back to the ICC and said, uh, "Look, this is what we think we need, and you should change your ruling, basically." And they said, "Screw you, court." We're going to go a long way. We've always done it, literally, in almost those words, in a, in a day after they got the ruling of the court. And so we took it back to the court again and said, you know, judges, how do you like this to come in their nose at you? Didn't they hear what you said? What are you going to do about it? And uh, we've been through a couple of rounds in the court. And now we're waiting for the judges to say what they're going to do about it. So we see if they send it back to the court, what they could do and say, if you didn't hear us the first time, have another go at it. Or they could say, you screwed up the second time, we're going to take it over and we'll cut down the capacity of the pipeline. So we'll okay. see what happens. Our third speaker is not logged in. Do you want to go ahead and do your presentation about nuclear? Okay. Um, uh, uh, there is a bill in Springfield at the present moment. I've forgotten the number. I wasn't counting on doing this one. Sorry. Uh, 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 we can find it for you. And it says basically there is a ban on new nuclear in Illinois at the present moment. We've got an awful lot of it, we've got more than any other state has. And they say, we don't want any more. And that was mean, meaning any more of these big gigawatt power stations like we have now, big centralized power stations. And what is, there's a bill that says, let's remove that ban on nuclear. And the reason for doing that is because the top rage at the present moment in nuclear is what's called small modular reactors. They're about as big as a container, shipping container, uh, they can be mass produced in quantity. The theory is they'll be cheaper because they're being mass produced and there won't be as many regulations about them. They can be taken out to many places in the country and buried underground, basically, and will produce a relatively small amount of en energy, um, about a hundredth of the power of a big nuclear station or a third in some cases. And for that reason, the um, nuclear industry people who can make money from this in Illinois, they want to remove this um, ban on nuclear. But the, the problem with that is that first of all, nobody has made a small nuclear reactor other than one or two in the labs like we're making now. And uh, nobody has got a proven product that's ready to mass produce. No one's ever got one that's actually even in production. And uh, so it's not a matter of timing, but it's a matter of, it, of bad timing. Even if you were to say, let's remove this um, ban in Illinois, it wouldn't be to the most optimistic 2030 before the first uh, of these nuclear reactors be ready to go in production. So you wasted another seven years when we were putting out um, a lot of coal fired power and energy and uh, um, uh, natural gas energy and so on. But if you were to take that money and put it into renewable energy, you would save all the CO2 that the plants are making at the present moment. So not only are these things long term, but because they don't benefit from economies of scale other than the manufacturing process, their cost of producing electricity is actually higher than the big giant nuclear plants we've got now. So um, your price goes up. They say, well, it doesn't matter because it's base load. It's a stable source that will balance the power of a reduced amount of um, Renewables you need that go up and down every day. Um, and uh, uh, in the meantime, we're going to have much better solar, much better batteries that will keep the electric energy from the wind and solar stable and we won't really benefit from that. These reactors will um, also produce the same kind of nuclear waste that the other big ones do, just a lot less of it for each plant. And they, because it's the same kind of process, they lend themselves to um, diversion of the nuclear waste into the production of plutonium. So in this country, it wouldn't be able to a problem. But if you start putting these things all over the world, which is what you need to do if you're going to really um, reduce the CO2 from coal-fired power stations, they'd be all over the place and a lot of um, you know, places that don't have the same degree of control over them that we do here. And you're going to have nuclear proliferation all over the place 
because many people can take this stuff and divert it, take the waste and divert it into plants that will refine the plutonium from the waste. So it's another problem with it. Um, the other thing is, do you think people really want to have a nuclear reactor in their back garden? What sort of opposition do you think we're going to get when we start putting it, put this thing there? Wouldn't you rather have a solar or wind plant in your back garden than a nuclear plant? So there's going to be a whole bunch of legislation that has to go on and the, uh, you know, the environment and urbanization and most of the people who live near these guys are going to fight it tooth and nail. And it's going to be very much longer to put these things in than they keep on dreaming about. So that's the basic story on the nuclear thing. And uh, it just, it just points out that a lot of these things we're talking about are false solutions to the climate change problem. They're, they're portrayed as being climate change problems, but they really won't come in time to do any good. Okay, question. All right. Yeah, question. Louder, what louder. Is, what, uh, what is the relative cost per kilowatt hour uh, using solar uh, versus uh, other renewable versus nuclear versus coal fired? I want to have that available at my fingertips, and I don't. Uh, but I mean, the basic price you can buy retail solar from is what um, I get mine from a uh, uh, community solar farm. And uh, it's a little hard to work out what it really costs because it comes as a deduction on your Commonwealth Edison bill and the price you pay to the company to the community solar farm. But I did know this that when I started getting my community solar, I had six straight months of zero bills from Commonwealth Edison. That bill from my solar farm was about a hundred dollars a month. Now, you know, some some of the times my 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 Commonwealth Edison bill had been six or seven hundred dollars, and this uh, the, 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 it did I did get a Commonwealth Edison bill that it was a win for this year with money on it. But it, before that, the offset from the, the new rule uh, not only offset the cost of electricity, but also <laughs> the cost of taxes and administration that you pay on the corporate base. So it was a heck of a good deal for me. Yeah. And anybody can do that with very, very little effort. Um, now, um, the one time cost of building the plant. Um, I have to go back and do some research on that for you. But bear in mind, it's a one time thing. It lasts 20 years. And you don't have to keep digging up the ground to get the coal or the oil out anymore yeah. or, the, or the uranium. You don't have the pollution problem that you would have from any uh, any other source of energy. Other than, well, the nuclear has a different kind of pollution problem, but uh, uh, you know, coal and natural gas both have uh, particulates come out, and other gases have to be dealt with either by scrubbing it or capturing it and sequestering it. So it is by far cheaper to put in um, renewable energy, especially when you consider the health impacts of um, uh, the fossil fuel industry in particular. There's an you know, enormous amount of these um, fossil fuel plants are close to minority communities and, and uh, uh, um, environmental justice communities, and they all suffer enormous health crisis with crisis as a result of that. And the costs of doing that are, are rarely taken into account when you're looking at the yep. so You can't prove it, you know, but it, it's no. Okay, so that, that, I'll do a better job next time I come with this one. Okay. Um, one more question back there. Yeah. Jonathan. So we have 5% or less than 5% of the population population. 25%. If we reduce that to the closest five percent possible, what do you envision? I'm emphasizing the positive. Yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, it'll be, well, you still have tire noise. You won't have the engine noise you do going down the Dan Ryan and so on. Um, you'll have much cleaner air. Uh, your cars will last a lot longer. Uh, the, the lower maintenance the internal combustion engine vehicle. Um, what else are you going to have? Uh, cleaner skies. Um, that's climate change. That'll be a huge change. It'll take years to happen because there's so much up there already. And that's one of the arguments for direct air capture to try and pull up the stuff that's so excessive up there. 
there's no less we haven't got a good way of doing that. Even the best ones that are being done now, like the Climb Works place in Iceland, is only doing 4,000 tons of CO2 out of the air a year. You know, it's nothing. It's about one or two cars or something like that. So it's a big problem. Um, are there any downsides from it? Yeah, if you're in the industry now, the fossil fuel industry is a hell of a downside. Uh, so that's a big problem. You know, there are certain communities where there's a big power station, it's the only source of income for a town. It runs the town. Now, when we put together the Clean Energy Jobs Act, or the Climate and Climate Equity Jobs Act, I should say, uh, last year, it passed. There's a lot of attention in there to those, uh, um, those justice things and trying to uh, produce money for the companies, the south towns that are going to lose their money from the power stations and the nuclear power stations and so on. So it's, it's a, a problem that everybody working on this is very aware of, that they've got to do things to make sure that the people who are in the industry don't get screwed by a conversion. They're, they're going to have to make changes, no doubt about that. But, you know, the, the rate at which the jobs in renewable energy are going up is massive. And uh, the, the jobs in the fossil fuel industry are relatively few because it's been there a long time. They've optimized it to reduce the labor costs. So there's a ton of automation being done there. So it isn't people that are getting hurt so much. I mean, the, the, the only people are taking no, no getting away from that. But the main thing is the profit of the fossil fuel industry is at is stake, basically. That's that's what they're fighting for is their profit. They don't give a damn about the people okay. in the industry at all. Okay. All right, answer? we got a couple from online. We'll okay. go Jake next. Go ahead, Jake. You got to unmute, Jake. Jake, if you're there, you got, you're got online. Come in, Jake. Can you hear me? All right. Yeah. Okay. We this can is, hear you now, this Jake. Is... You're on your... Yes. Can you hear me? Okay. This is this is a question for Charlie. Um, could you re, could you repeat again what the what the energy bill is in the state? Yes, that's what I was going to comment. Tim called on me. It is SB Senate Bill zero zero seven six S and it is a bill to lift the moratorium on new nuclear reactors in Illinois, SB 0076. And you have about 10 days to contact your member of the General Assembly and voice your presumably opposition to this nefarious piece of legislation. And I wanted to ask Richard a question. By any chance, Richard, did you have occasion to see that article I sent out about in the area surrounding Chernobyl, the 100 square miles, that the only form of life left in that area are packs of roving mutated dogs, wild dogs are the only things that can inhabit the area. Did, by any chance, did you see that? I did not see that article, but I have seen films of Chernobyl. I had a guy come and do a presentation for us on Chernobyl who spent a lot of time out there. And he confirms the same sort of thing you're talking about, Charlie. Uh, there's very little there. It's, it's still dangerously radioactive where, wherever the plume went to adjacent to the plant. And uh, so very little life is, life is going on around there. And uh, there are still people suffering from cancer and so on. They got from the fallout, not just in the immediate Chernobyl area, but across Europe where they got the plume there. So it's uh, terrible. Thank you. All right. All right. Go ahead. And then we'll get your next, okay. Stephanie. Yeah, go ahead, Ellen. Yeah, just I know from people around here, like Andy and um, that the nuclear power of anti new movement was big and strong. It, it, my guess is that maybe it's gone down. I mean, right? It's, what are the challenges? And, well, first of all, the, the first thing uh, people say, first of all, let's try and get rid of the nukes altogether. And when you look at what we've got to do, we've got about you know 20% coal, 20% natural gas now, about 50% um, nuclear and 10% renewables, something like that. 
remember the exact numbers, but it's in that proportion. So the, the huge proportion of our own does come from nukes at the moment. And so uh, the idea of taking the nukes offline doesn't work. You know, we, we've got, we, can't, we can't replace them, but it, it's more important because they're already built, they're already working in operation, they're mostly all fueled up and can run off for quite a long time without putting more fuel into them. Better off to leave them where they are, plan to take them offline by 2050, let's say. I think it was in, it's within seizure, I think. And then uh, use the and also allow for the extra load that's going to come when everybody starts electrifying things. So it's going to use more energy when we get everything electric than we're using now. Why is everything going electric? It's the only clean way we can really uh, prevent putting new CO2 into the air. Not gas or the gas is Natural gas than still puts it, isn't, isn't it? It's worse, than, it's worse than renewable energy. It's better than coal. Absolutely. Only if you don't count all the leaks of methane along the way. And that's a big problem because the, 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 the wells where they get methane from the natural gas are notorious for leaking large amounts of gas. There are gas storage plants, two of them in Illinois, that uh, one of them is right underneath the, um, the main aquifer, and it's the Mount Love uh, gas storage field. Oh, it's been leaking for years and years, but it's so important to the money that, can't, that People's Gas, I think, owns that one, that they make, they won't cut it off. So the wells are being polluted, the you get coming into the natural gas coming into the houses and so on. They had to shut down some schools because the leaks were so bad and just abandoned the buildings. And some of the plants in the farmer's fields show little circles where the gas is coming up and killing off the um, uh, this natural gas. So, you know, there's, there's lots of bad things that happen even with natural gas, even though it's nominally better than coal, it's a toss up. And the, the, the industry has been lying about the amount of methane they've been leaking for years and years and years. And we're just finally getting enough satellites up there we can really track it and see where it's coming from. And it's staggering how much more methane is being leaked, which is stupid because, you know, they could sell it if they bother to capture it. It's too easy just to let it go up there and leak. And there's a ton of uh, abandoned oil wells and natural gas wells, millions of them in the country that never got capped properly. And it's a $200 billion project to cap those oil wells. And who's going to do it? Taxpayer again, of course, gets stuck with, stuck with the cost. They're doing it slowly. But that's, that's the problem with the methane and the natural gas. It's the only, only effective ways of getting Electricity will be from wind and solar, geothermal, hydro, uh, and um, tidal. There are a couple, there are many ways you can get clean energy, uh, but solar and wind are going to be the big ones. There's a, a, a lot more attention being paid to geothermal now. So that's a super way of doing it if you've got the right geology to do that. But um, it's uh, in places like Yellowstone Park, you could put a nice geothermal plant in because the heat's so close to the surface there, it wouldn't cost as much, but it's a natural, natural, natural park, so you don't want to do that. Yeah, just to follow up. All right, I Stephanie. Um, Stephanie, uh, question. A follow up question is that I used to work at People's Energy and they pushed me out in 2003. <laughs> How has things changed since 2003 uh, in terms, because I didn't we are here and there's more fracking. And so, I mean, it's the whole thing, but they seem to care about nuclear. Well, I they, think you know, nominally yeah, care all of the, you know, the Commonwealth Edison's and the, the People's Gas and so on, they know it's coming. What they're doing is to try and keep going with the old style as long as they can, to stretch out the time before they have to cut it off so they can make money at it. And you know, in some cases they're putting in new pipe, like uh, people's, people's Gas is putting a lot of new pipe. They say, we want 20 years of use on that pipe. And so let's try a trick like putting hydrogen in the pipe instead of, instead of methane. And, and uh, then we can keep on so it's clean. Well, that's not true either because you burn hydrogen on out as well. And that's, that's 200 times worse than CO2 for the atmosphere over a short period of time. You know, the methane itself is 70%, 70 times worse than, up to 87 times worse over 20 years 
than um, CO2 is. And that nitrogen oxides are far, far worse than that. And also hydrogen, if it escapes, it, uh, it soaks up the hydroxyl ions up there in the sky that are the ones that kill off the methane. So you, you don't actually, hydrogen itself is not pollution, but it, it, it stops the methane degrading as fast as it should be. So putting hydrogen in the pipelines and saying it's clean is just a, it's just a fiction of the industry. All right, Stephanie. Stephanie, how are you doing, Stephanie? Um, okay. Um, in regards to the Illinois bill, SB 76, people need to call their house representatives because it didn't go through the house. It went through the Senate where it passed and now it's gonna go back to the house. So you need to call your house representatives and tell them to oppose SB 76. And in regards to methane, um, that was a big issue with fracking because those fracking wells were, reeky, well, were leaking all kinds of uh, methane. And that is worse than carbon dioxide for the first, I don't know, whatever amount of decades. But once again, the industry was not regulated enough. That's where it all goes back to. I mean, they're just not regulated. And uh, if there are rules put in place, the EPA or whoever does not follow through. So it's kind of like, uh, you know, a smoke screen. Yeah. That's all. That's all I have to say. One of the problems is, first of all, the Republicans have tried for years to defund the EPA and the other, other <laughs> organizations. PIMSA, for example, has got a, a ridiculously small number of people for the things they have to do. And, uh, you know, it's like 60 people who are responsible for looking at all the pipelines in the country and seeing if they're secure. You know, there's hundreds of thousands of miles of pipeline, and they just can't do it with the staff they have. Secondly, they, what left, what left is captive to the industry. For example, take PIMSA. They don't write all their regulations. They rely upon the American Petroleum Institute to write the regulations, and they just include them by reference. And it's not easy to see those regulations. If you can see the, you can see the PIMSA stuff that says, here, 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 go see API, but you can't get to API, go and do some more. Yeah. So they've been taken over, but in Illinois, it's the same way. The, the, the uh, EPA and the um, Natural Resources Department have been defunded to a large extent. We tried to get them some more money last year and did, but they need more money. And of course it takes time to train people to do that kind of thing. And in the meantime, they are very much dependent on or they've got buddy-buddy relationships with the industry. So they don't do as good a job as they should do in, in protecting us all from the, from the change of the industry. Okay, yes. All right. Yes. Yeah. Repeat the question, please. The question was, well, it wasn't a question, but it was uh, saying that quite correctly that we've had small nuclear reactors in submarines and in uh, aircraft carriers and who knows where else. Oh yeah, that's safe. There's, there's no problem. So they, they've got an unlimited supply of cold water that they can use to cool it. And uh, they are, you know, they're, they're very, very carefully managed and researched. You couldn't take one of those reactors and suddenly plunk it down to your backyard and, and uh, start making power that way. Were so, there yeah. tragedies of submarine sinking? Uh, Charlie. The issue, I know Andy talked about the all right, all right. making bombs, right? With the, with oh, yeah. the okay. plutonium with, with, or with the plutonium, yeah. I mean, right. the, the, I don't, who knows what happens to the waste from the submarines and so on, and they have to be taken out every so often. And it's it's up it in the ocean. All right, Anna, you've got a question on mute, go ahead. Yes, I was wondering how the group feels about public ownership of, for example, a thorium salt molten nuclear reactor. Because that's where I feel like the Greens are want. They want public ownership of these items, which like for the Earth Bill, it's just double downing on okay, deductions sure. for corporations. The, the question was, you know, what about public ownership for these new new power sources? Well, um, yeah, for things going forward, correct. 
Next one. What's yes, that? for the future. Okay. Well, the question is, there doesn't seem to be a problem getting money to build the things. And uh, the, the big problem is who takes the, the risk, the liability, and who disposes of the waste product in the end? They give it all back to the federal government. It's supposed to get rid of it and deal with it for hundreds of thousands of years, protect it all. So um, they leave the hard part to the, um, uh, to the government and they take the profit from running these things, which is guaranteed by the um, regulatory authorities. They get a guaranteed return on their investment in these, in these plants, whether they be small and, nuclear, small and modular or they be big. Um, they take that money very, very gratefully and um, always wanting more. Um, and so public ownership um, doesn't really solve the problem of uh, getting rid of the CO2 very much, I don't think. What do you think about the impact of the, you know, the lies that people deny climate change? It, it's a real problem. I mean, we, we work with this all the time. We're running in, we're working with a farming crowd. And we have to walk very carefully on this because there's a lot of pretty bright red people down there. And they, they tend to say, uh, I don't believe in climate change. I don't believe that this flood I had last year or these, ter these tornadoes that came through last week are anything to do with climate change. They're all natural, you know. So you, we decided not to, to tread lightly on the climate change aspects of this thing when we're working in the far east countries at least. Okay. Otherwise, we'll turn off people and, you know, it's not listen to our other messages. The other ones decide that. But behind the groups that are doing the work, there is no question that climate change is the driving force. You know, we know, we all know it's the right thing, but we can't can't keep on working with a mixed crowd there if we don't if we go for climate change, the big thing. All right. Well, was, uh, was Meryl Greer Domina your other speaker? Yes. And She's I, here now. Okay, and she may a, talk about what I already talked about. I'm not sure what she was going to talk about. Okay, Meryl, uh, unmute. You're welcome to the college. We're in uh, the middle. If you got a presentation, go ahead and give it if you're ready. Meryl, are you there? We can unmute you if you're if you are uh, ready to do your part of the presentation tonight. I don't know if she had anything to say. Okay, well. If maybe she don't should, have it, maybe we should go to open mic five to ten minutes each. Tim. All right, then we'll go to open microphone. I'll let our speaker get a chance to settle down and uh, we'll kind of like Richard. Speaker tonight. All right. Open mic. Let her roll. We're going to do an open mic tonight. Who wants it? Oh, we're going to give you five minutes each. Who wants to speak first? Go ahead. Yeah, we got time, five or 10, what the heck? We're going five minutes each. Because Why? We're... Because we've got a lot of people here want to speak, Charlie. Okay. Uh, you don't know. Can everybody hear me? Yes. All right. All right, first of all, well, that's good. Uh, all right, all right. I, would, I just want to say, you know, I'm. you guys may not believe this to look at me, but I'm actually old enough to remember when, when what, what, what we're now calling climate change was called global warming. I yeah, mean, yeah. That was, it was, that was a long time ago, but I actually am old enough to remember that, if none of you are. And um, now, let me just tell you a little bit about the origins of this, 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 this use. The, the, the term climate change is basically being used as a euphemism for global warming. And let me tell you, let me tell you how that started. I'll tell you a little story. The term climate change was coined by a man named Frank Lux. He was a uh, conservative, he's a conservative, he's still alive. He's a conservative who does focus groups. He was hired by the global warming deniers uh, to determine how to make their case to the public. And in focus groups, Frank Lux found that the term climate change did not scare people as much as global warming. Global warming is very alarming, but Climate change, that just sounds inevitable and natural. It doesn't sound like a big deal. Um, climate change, I could get warmer, I could get colder, who knows? Anyway, um, so Frank Luntz advocated that the deniers use that term, climate change, instead of global warming in their own, in their own publications. So the deniers 
started using that term in there. I won't call them skeptics. I call them deniers. Uh, the, the oil industry is the main driving force behind them. They actually know that climate change is, right? excuse me, see, see, I'm doing it. They know that global warming is real. And um, uh, they're actually planning on, on how they can exploit the oil resources of the Arctic once the ice caps melt. So they, they know it's happening. Um, and um, anyway, the deniers started using the term climate change in their press releases. Um, uh, and then the media started, groups like the Heartland Institute here in Chicago, and then the media started using that, uh, the new term, and then, and then everybody started using it, even environmentalists started using it, which is terribly bad for, for our cause. I, I consider myself, I used to work, I used to be in the Sierra Club with Richard Stuckey until the COVID pandemic hit, and, um, and, and it's very misleading because climate change is not the same thing as global warming, uh, you know, the, the climate's always been changing, even before there were humans living on Earth. Climate change is inevitable. Ice ages are a form of climate change, but global warming is not inevitable. It's man-made, and what we start, we can also stop. So, since the term global warming scares people more than uh, more, I think we should actually use that term um, so that we can have an impact on public opinion in the right direction. Uh, everybody knows what it means. Uh, and we want people to be scared. I think if we called it global warming instead of climate change, maybe we would have stopped it by now. Okay, who's next? Hey, Merle, I'm here now. Can you hear me? Yeah, Merle, we can hear you. Want to go ahead and give your presentation? Sure. Okay. okay. Well, what time you need? Oh, I don't know. Between about eight minutes. That's fine. Maybe less. That's fine. Go ahead. Okay. Well. Um, I'm going to talk about why I think we need to make sure that we don't have any worse climate change than we currently have. Um, and I like this quote, to change the world's climate is to shake the foundation of the Earth's life support systems. There are so many ways that really are going to mess things up. I have them in some categories. Water is a real problem, but I'm not going to talk about it separately because it shows up in everything else I say. Problems with the weather, changes are likely to cause allocations in temperature, rainfall, snow, humidity, and seasons. Extreme weather such as torrential rains, tornadoes, hurricanes, and heat waves will be worse and more frequent than we have now. These lead to damage to people and animals and property and often the damage is major with um, animals and people being killed. In the environment, changes again our temperature, precipitation, they're both gonna disrupt where plants can grow and the plants habits. Warmer weather temperatures will not kill the eggs of insects like bark beetles or infectious pathogens, such as the mosquitoes that carry malaria, also bacteria and viruses. That means there will be more insects um, and more problems that the insects cause. Drought will cause desertification and destructive um, heat storms. Heat and dry conditions cause more wildfires and make it more difficult to put them out. Warmer temperatures will melt ice sheets and cause sea level rise. Clean and fresh water will become scarcer due to pollution, runoff from cities and farms that contain massive amount of chemicals. The melting of ice sheets and glaciers um, when they invade the um, so, so, clear, fresh water with salt water, they become, we can't drink it anymore. There's a lot of pro things we can't do. It's not as good for agriculture at all. Animals will be affected. Animal diversity will continue to drop due to habitat and food loss. Animals' life cycle and habits will become out of sync with their habitats. That means, among other things, when um, infants are born, it won't be in the right season for the mothers to easily get food for them or, or enough food for themselves to, to nurse for mammals. Um, Fish and sea life will suffer from nutrients added to water sources from farm fertilizer runoff 
and sewer runoff from towns and cities. And again, winters will not be cold enough to kill insects, eggs, increasing their numbers, and tropical species will now invade um, temperate zones. Um, climate change will affect farming and food. The doubling of carbon dioxide in the air could cause reduction of food, causing famine and starvation. Higher temperatures will bring additional insects and viruses to temperate zones. Soil deteriorates, which lessens food's nutrition. Artificial fertilizers help produce crops, but they do not rejuvenate the soil. So soil loses its nutritional values in the food. Areas of flooding, drought, and higher temperatures will need different crops and it will take a while for the farmers to really know which crops they should be planting. There are many health disadvantages to climate change. Um, climate change is a risk multiplier that exasperates existing health problems. Climate change distributes and it impacts disease spread by insect vectors, waterborne vectors, and infectious diseases. Asthma and other respiratory diseases are triggered by pollution, including wildflower wildfires. Depletion of the ozone aggravates asthma, raises the risk of pneumonia, and causes other diseases of the respiratory system. And just today I heard that the ozone layer is losing its uh, protection again. It's going to be a problem soon. Temperatures above 90 degrees Fahrenheit lead to heat stress, stroke, higher rates of accidents and related physical problems, therefore reducing work capacity and productivity. Particle pollution caused by greenhouse gases, particularly from vehicle traffic, traffic and fossil fuel power plants can cause damage to the lungs, heart, eyes, and other cardiovascular problems. There's also problems that will happen to cities and employment, but I do wanna give, um, a hopeful um, suggestion. We have now a bill in Congress called the Earth Act to Stop Climate Pollution by 2030. And its House um, regulation number is 598. I'll, I'll put these things in the chat um, when I finish talking, but it, it recommends that we uh, only allow electricity to be produced by alternative sources that we insist after 2030, there is only electric cars manufactured by companies in the United States. Used cars can still be used, but no new um, used, no new um, gas produced, gas driven cars. Okay. And the third is that um, agriculture, um, well, um, corporate owned agriculture will use regenerative and conservative practices. Um, I'll put that in the um, chat. Thank you for the time. I'm done. All right. I'm going to take about five minutes now myself. There is a website out there called the Roadmap to Nowhere that thoroughly debunks Jacobson's view of how the world is going to be powered totally by renewables. Now imagine trying to build a state the size of Vermont with enough 50 story skyscrapers, which is about the material that it would take to power the country with renewables. Um, Professor um, Jake. Gibson from Stanford University has one full at a time, please. Thoroughly debunked. If you go to Roadmap to Nowhere, and I know the guys who personally debunked them, they spoke at the Thorium Energy Alliance conference that we'd be much better off <laughs> with the small modular thorium nuclear power as a way to power an advanced industrialized society. What you guys don't understand is that the world is going to advance. The world is going to be increasing its power usage. 
population is going down because by the time you get above eight thousand dollars per year, according to the CAA World Factbook, people don't want the same number of children. So it is stabilizing. As a matter of fact, it's one of the biggest trends coming into the 21st century that the population of the world is going to slow down and stabilize. What will happen? Why is this happening? It's because of industrial development. It's benefited a lot of the civilization. It's benefited a lot of mankind. And yes, I do believe that we need to solve climate change. Yes, I do believe that we need an advanced but we're going to have to power the advanced industrialized study. You know, you talk about all this nuclear waste we're having. Isn't it better to have it in a small, hyper big cube than in the air and in the water and in everywhere else? I mean, the emissions issued by a coal plant, if they were, are more than what comes out of a nuclear plant. Some of the uh, things that come out of coal smoke are even worse than what uh, comes out of the, some of the nuclear plants that we use. And the thing is, is nuclear waste really nuclear waste? Yeah. Percent of the uh, power yes. of is still being used. Who wants it? Reprocess it. And yes, I know there might be some nuclear fuel hanging around that can be made for bombs, but the point of the matter is the genie's out of the bottle. China's already got a pilot plant up in operation in uh, the desert out there, and they're going to be putting these things on widespread deployment if they can get successful with it. Why? Because China also has a big pollution problem and they're trying like hell to not only develop, but also make a cleaner environment. Now, if you guys think it are going to go into this fantasy land of powering everything by wind and solar, which I agree renewables have a big place. All I can point is look to what happened to Germany. They're burning more coal now than they ever did, even when they had their nuclear plants up and running. They shut them down, they need the power, they're burning coal and the renewables aren't cutting it. Maybe once last year, renewable power was more than what the output of it was, but what they had was stable base loads. Now, why am I so much in the nuclear power? Because yeah, I'd like to know. I think that that's the only real way we're gonna get off fossil fuel and we're gonna be able to maintain an advanced industrial society. Yes, we have some problems with the waste or the recycling of the fuel and everything else, but this can be done and solved. It's just going to take what Alvin Weinberg said. Uh, we're going to have to get used to institutions as such we're not accustomed. And the point of the matter is Alvin Weinberg, one of the inventors of the uh, light water reactor, knew about this stuff way back in 1968 and was actually fired by the Atomic Energy Commission because of his concerns about radiation and climate change. But what he did try to do was come up with a safer, better reactor, which is called the Molten Salt Reactor, which was operational for well over 6,000 hours in the 1960s. And it was a proven concept. It's just that the government decided at the time that they were gonna to go to breeder reactors. And the not story is not true. Charlie, you know what, I'm talking about- Why did you tell the story? Why don't you tell the truth? One fool at a time, Charlie. One fool at a time, Charlie. Yeah, you know better, Charlie. You gotta tell the truth. One fool at a time, Charlie. Right, One fool at a time. You know. All right, gentlemen. I'm just gonna put it like this, okay? Thorium, thorium, molten salt reactors hold tremendous possibility for humanity. It's here, Stephanie. And if we full at a time, Charlie, we will show it was the right way to go. There we go, gentlemen. Go ahead, go ahead, Ernie. Go ahead, Ernie. Yeah. Stephanie's got her hand raised. All right. Well, yeah. Uh, Ernie will get up and then to Anna. You want to go ahead next, or do you want to wait till after Ernie? We'll let Ernie right. go first, and then we'll get you next, Anna. All right. Are these microphones right, working? Stephanie. Which one works? This one? No, no. Both of them work. One's they for both the work. All right. One's for the podcast. I'll just try and for... speak with, a, with my outside voice. <laughs> first of all, thank you for the presentation. I think they were good. We got a lot of useful information. Uh, I find it interesting that cars will stop running if there's too much carbon dioxide in the air. 
but it strikes me if there's that much carbon dioxide in the air that a car won't run, what about people? They would probably perish too. So anyway, uh, very interesting overall. Uh, I'm just going to touch briefly on a sidebar, but I think it's a very important sidebar to the old, to the whole issue of uh, saving the planet uh, environmentally. And I think that the most important way we can do all these things, we can convert to renewable fuels, we can use less energy, and we can do all kinds of things like that. But uh, what will do the greatest good in the longest run uh, is if we reduce population. Now, I know that that is a very difficult thing to do. I'm not, I'm not suggesting we dig a big hole and put a certain percentage of people in it. I'm just saying that we should reduce births. It's very, very difficult to do because it's socially built into every culture in the world that we should have as many babies as possible, or at least as many as we want. And yeah, every single baby that is born uh, is going to use a lot of non-renewable resources as well as the renewable and they're going to put a lot of pollution into the air and uh, it's something that, that people talk about but uh, people don't do anything about it because it's almost impossible to do it uh, politically and I, I must confess myself I have three children so I'm way over the limit uh, myself but I think this is one of the areas which which all the people that are talking about uh, saving the environment this is an issue that almost none of them ever even bring up and I think it would be the single most best way uh, if we could actually do something about it. Thank you. All right, uh, Stephanie, you want to go next? Stephanie, you got your hand up. You want to go next? Yes. Go ahead, Stephanie. Um, you had mentioned in regards to Germany shutting down their nuclear power plants and getting their sources from France. Uh, France does have a lot of nuclear power plants, but their power plants were shut down because of the heat and because they couldn't get enough cool water to cool the reactors. Uh, so that, that's a problem. Uh, now, the big reactors, I'm not talking about SMNRs because they aren't uh, really designed and have not been approved by the NRC. So you can't even build factories to produce these SMNRs until you have a design that is approved. So this is way into the future. The other thing is that um, I'm not exactly sure about how much of the, uh, the percentage of power uh, is from nuclear power plants in Illinois, but I know, know that they do export some. So all that they produce is not being used here in Illinois. The other thing is the waste. The two biggest problems with nuclear power is the economy and the waste. They haven't figured out to do what the waste. SMRs may have a smaller amount of um, uh, toxicity livelihood, but it's still there. So do we wanna pass that along? The other thing is, um, this is just a, a, a sidebar, there's a gentleman called Guy Pierce, P-E-A-R-C-E. -E. And I mean, he is what you might call a, um, um, like, like a downer. And he really thinks that we're beyond hope. But he does say in one of his recent podcasts that we have to shut down nuclear because he feels that we as humans are doomed, but maybe the planet can keep on going as far as plant life, maybe some animals, fishes, et cetera. So that's my comment. Thank you. And I want to thank Richard Stuckey for the presentation. OK, uh, who is next as far as the rebuttal is concerned? All right, who else is rebutting? I am. Go ahead, let's get up front. All right, uh, go ahead and you got five minutes. And then we'll get you. And then we'll get you next. Yeah. Okay. Then, uh, we'll uh, as you, you know, I've said this before. I um, I've always been an environmentalist. Um, I began with the Citizens Party. That's Larry Cowder, uh, ran for president. First environmentalist, the big colors environmentalist. But um, you just need to deal with um, 
uh, global warming, as my friend uh, Don Mitchell pointed out, it's best to use that term because it's uh, what really is uh, the danger to the planet. Although, you know, back in 1980, when I first publicly really uh, tried to work for, for the environment, uh, it wasn't completely certain of that, but uh, over the years it has become certain. And uh, we need to uh, uh, do a lot of things. Uh, some things could be in the mix, as uh, Tim Bolger, my other friend, pointed out. We could possibly consider storing reactors since they're a little bit less dangerous than the uh, uranium plutonium type reactors. So, and nobody's mentioned the uh, Ukraine uh, invasion by Russia and the danger that was posed by the Zaporizhzhi uh, nuclear uh, plants, a whole bunch of them, over six. And uh, they very nearly could have had a meltdown very, very easily. Maybe all six of them. Uh, the Russian uh, danger that they invaded really. I mean, really, the whole world should have gotten involved uh, in sending in troops to take over those plants before they were attacked by Russia. It's kind of ridiculous that uh, the world and uh, obviously our government here has just been lackadaisical about dealing with the dangers, both uh, of nature caused by humans uh, and they're accidentally and eventually. And uh, we need to uh, we need to mitigate things, and they have to um, evolve um, the uh, new AI capabilities that are coming up. We have to be very careful to have ethical AI be directing our future rather than uh, inimical or chaotic AI. So that is something we have to focus on. Uh, environmentalists has to have to be cognizant of that, and. Uh, uh, you know, all things that might have to be in the mix. Uh, I'm not sure. I've never actually looked directly at all the numbers myself. And of course, the numbers matter um, as far as uh, what you need in terms of the mix to get to the point where we don't um, overwhelm the environment. Uh, there was a recent program on NOVA um, about the Arctic uh, sinkholes, which shows that the uh, methane in the permafrost is being released at a much higher rate than was predicted by the models that environmentalists had just a few years ago. So a lot of things are very uh, uh, dangerous. Um, we don't know. We need to. Uh, this whole carbon dioxide thing of the sequester that the gentleman here was talking about, I forgot the name, sorry, but um, uh, the fact that it's dangerous, we can try that. Um, Carbon dioxide sequestering has been put forward as a possible uh, geoengineering um, plan to mitigate the carbon dioxide and, and methane and other um, chemical gases so that are there. I might have run over my time. There's so much to discuss about. Um, yeah. But uh, let's just hope that more people get engaged. Let's do proper languaging, for proper messaging, even though uh, we might take the risk of it eliminating some of these people that are for anti-science. So uh, let's just hope we can do better. Thank you to our speaker. Uh, one of the challenges we have to uh, collectively slam on the brakes right now is to reduce consumption. So if that seems like a daunting task, I've written a motivational poem on behalf of the American population to feel like you have it, we have it within our capacity to reduce our consumption. When you ask yourself, why me? Instead, write yourself a rhyme. Then life begins to shine like sunlight on a country creek. When we ask ourselves, why we? instead organize then the fire burning inside becomes a global jubilee if my experience is your experience then we know there is hope yet if our experience is y'all's experience then our souls aren't ill spent this life we live this grind earth is learned love so keep doing it it's a simple skill love still exists who believed when no one did she did so grow to know each other's worlds we're in and besides, we're only visiting. She always reminds us kids, 
more than like it, more than love it. Just live, live because of it beyond all these no name yets, a homemade moment. So like, amen, Curtis Mayfield style, you are missed. Sung by a young soulful mother to her daughters and sons. Sung by a young soul blessed mom, that is it. It's the best us possible, but not the best yet to be. It's the best now blooms into how we know it without knowing. We dream and we organize, we the peeps. There is more inside to find capacity of we. Just gotta remember, gotta remember, keep looking and keep working, keep holding on to each other. To survive the insanity of wars, lies, and greed. Love lives in us, love is you and me. If my experience is your experience, well, then we know. If our experience is y'all's experience, now all souls. Learn love, so love still lives. We all get a vote. If love still lives, there's hope. If there's hope yet, love knows us for people. Love knows us as her people. So when you ask yourself, why me? Instead, write yourself a rhyme, and then life begins to shine like sunlight on a country creek. When we ask ourselves why we instead organize and then the fire burning inside becomes a global jubilee. It's always the most difficult. It's always the most challenging right before you have a great breakthrough. Uh, we've done these things before in history where there was a great challenge before us and we uh, rose to the occasion. And uh, I'm so happy and proud to be in the state of Illinois with all the people here tonight and throughout the state who see it as a blessing and not a burden to meet the challenge of our lifetimes. And thank you so much to our speaker tonight for an excellent topic. Okay. Who's next? Andy, go ahead. All right. Andy, Andy is uh, coming up next to... Uh, Give us our uh, okay, Andy. You're you're all set. Five minutes, Andy. Thank you to our speaker for an excellent presentation tonight. I'd like to add a few facts uh, that weren't covered. As many people have spoken about, there's so many facts, so much knowledge that it's hard to give a coherent summary uh, in an hour or two. I mean. There's just so much to read. What I, I, I pulled two books off the shelf. This one is 40 years old. It's called The Energy Controversy, Avery Levin's Questions and Answers, The Soft Path, Avery and his critics. So Avery answered all the different arguments of why a green energy economy isn't feasible. Okay, this, this book is new, the climate book, by Greta Thunberg, she she added edited. There's probably 50 of the finest minds of them writing about climate change and what to do about it and everything else. If you don't have time to read the last hundred books that I've digested on global warming and climate change, this one is a summary and it's brand new. It's the best thing I've ever seen. I would highly recommend it. It's called the. <clears throat> can you see that? Yes, we can. The climate book by Greta Thunberg. Yes. Brand new, it's hardcover, and it's got uh, all kinds of graphs and charts, pictures. There's a few facts that are seldom, seldom ever mentioned by promoters of nuclear power. One book that summarized the philosophy of the promoter of nuclear power is called The Cult of the Atom. It's kind of like a religious cult, like, like the cult of Amway. Uh, you have to be uh, in, in a mind altering cult to see the success of it or to believe in a success where there's failure all around you. Yugoslavia, here's, here's some things that what has nuclear power given us in the last 40 years? Tons of nuclear waste all over the world and depleted uranium weapons that are now depleted uranium as a offshoot of to the nuclear power industry is being used in armor piercing tank shells and bunker buster bombs. Yugoslavia, Iraq, and Afghanistan were considered uninhabitable for humans in 2005. A new article today is talking about our into Ukraine now. 
that country will become uninhabitable for humans where women really can't have healthy babies anymore. All nuclear fuel cycles are subject to leakage. Even with new, new thorium nuclear power plants, you're gonna be dealing with very uranium and plutonium samples of all kinds of radioactive debris and material and waste. And accidents happen, it leaks out, and you have to fence off an area that's uninhabitable for humans. The roadmap to nowhere, I just checked that website <clears throat> too. That was that article I was mainly put up in 2017. Well, that was before solar and wind power and renewables had dropped 90% in price. Rocky Mountain Institute today <clears throat> has all kinds of reports showing how we can stay on a path, <clears throat> a pathway toward getting, cutting down 50% of fossil fuel building by 2030. Alvin Weinberg is quoted as, you know, talking about molten, molten salt reactors have all kinds of problems. Think about that, molten salt, salt running at five or 600 degrees. Uh, they're not clean, safe, and too cheap to meter. But the other thing is nobody talks about the time frame. talking about developing and building Maybe sometime in the future, we'll have small modular reactors like the containment field they have on the Star Trek Enterprise. But before we get those reactors online and helping cut, you know, solve the global warming problem, the ice caps will have melted and the sea level is, is up 152 feet and the coastal cities are all gone before thorium or anything else can make any kind of sizable dent at all. And, you know, promoting the next generation of modular reactors as a solution is like talking about developing a, a fireproof paint while your house is burning down. The last thing I would say, again, talking about the benefits of the next generation of nuclear power plants is, uh, or just, you know, talking, the Wikipedia site says, Thorium would be great, except for there's a problem with prol proliferation with weapons. <clears throat> and that's that's just on, on the generic knowledge when you're dealing with radioactive materials, breeder reactors, the thorium reactors were breeders, they didn't produce plutonium. So it's, it's kind of talking about the next generation of nuclear power plants is kind of like saying, well, other than that, Mrs. Kennedy, how was your trip to Dallas? <laughs> There you go. It, you know, there, there is no way, no, absolutely no way to get around the problem of nuclear waste. We don't know where to bury or what to do with it. And accidents happen. And as long as you have an operating nuclear power industry, you have a viable nuclear weapons industry all over the planet. The only way to get rid of nuclear weapons and give humanity a shot at have, not having nuclear conflicts in the future is the total shutdown of the nuclear power industry. And one last thing, no insurance company anywhere is talking about insuring the next generation of reactors because they're uninsurable. Any kind of accident will wipe out an insurance company. And so look to who, follow the money. Woodward and Bernstein said that, follow the money. Who is funding the people that are promoting thorium to us. Who, who is behind that? Okay, and why, uh, and we have to be compassionate, just like we have been compassionate with uh, friends and neighbors who had a son or a daughter that got sucked into some crazy religious cult. The, the kids have to be ultimately deprogrammed and brought back to reality. And that's what we have with, we have to bring people back to reality uh, I was once in 1980, I thought the future was nuclear. I was all, all for nuclear power and everything else, clean, safe, and too cheap to near until I started to read what was being put out by the nuclear scientists that were working in the field. I've got a hundred, over 200 books from John Goffman on down, the people that discovered plutonium, uranium, the atomic bomb, they're all saying the same thing. There is no chance for a viable path for a viable human survival on this planet with an operating nuclear power industry. It's one or the other. 
So I would say shut down the nuclear power industry and yeah. the Rocky Mountain Institute and start looking at the uh, potential for cheap renewables. Also, last thing I'll say is <clears throat> there's another article, another video up on Ford's factory in Michigan that is going to be producing hundreds of thousands of vehicles with the next generation batteries that will be a battery backup for your house. It's called solar wind and battery swab and utilities are looking at these big standby batteries to give uninterrupted 24 hour power solar wind and battery can replace the 24 hour operation of nuclear power plants at a fraction of the cost of building these. That's the other thing. The nuclear energy has to be propped up with massive welfare of tax dollars. They're not economically viable anywhere. They never have been. They've been part of, they've been propped up by the weapons industry and, and the cost has been hidden from the public. Thank you all. Okay, who's next? We got we got any more uh, takers? Any more takers for uh, yeah. Charlie or me or whatever. Okay, go ahead. Uh, I'll, go, go, I'll I'll let you go. Then what we'll do is if there's nobody else besides uh, Ellen, we'll then uh, let our speakers get the last word. Yeah, I want to go. Because Charlie hasn't gone yet. Right? All right. Well, um, and, uh, we'll let Ellen go. I'll go last. What? I'll go last. All right, Charlie. Go ahead, Ellen. Yeah, thank you. Um, so, you know, I have to actually kind of thank Charlie for bringing you here because uh, I um, I have met people that I wouldn't have known about. And, you know, sometimes I'm like, let me pick all the people. But uh, I have to acknowledge that, uh, that you know, he does know about industry. And so I, I learned a lot. Thank you. I'd like to learn more about it. Uh, my biggest comment is that, you know, I was raised by a climate denier, uh, a Manhattan Institute, you know, they publish and I, my latter part of my life now is to, you know, that I see that there's a public relations industry, a lobby that is just misinforming us. And um, they're huge and they're with Citizens United, they've got billions. And, um, you know, I used to work in corporations, uh, market research, and I, I was idealistic enough to think that corporations and the social conscience were working together. And uh, potentially they could, you know, but um, it seems that the trend is going the other way, that uh, they really, it's like a war, an information war of corporations against the public interest, you know, the, the public uh, estate, the public domain, and it's downright evil. I've, I've been focused on vaccines that, um, and, you know, and Robert Kennedy is my big hope now because I think he can bring us all together. And, you know, those who will, I, there's just a, there's a targeting on those, this denial campaigns, and um, it doesn't matter what the issue is, but I see that, I think we, we need to measure public opinion and see that we're being diseducated. You know, um, our generation really were so idealistic and I thought we had the momentum, you know, um, in terms of don't destroy the planet, don't uh, kill us off with toxins. And, you know, but it, it all comes down to deregulation. I had worked, uh, you know, at People's Energy looking at deregulation and I, it's like, well, it'll be good for, you know, uh, what's the harm? But what you have to do is look at the way things were before the regulations were put in and then just put the regulations back in the EPA the way it used to be uh, you know and I, I do think you should up your you know show how how evil at, and the problem is you know from a public relations point of view we have to be a little more um, like rather than being afraid to upset the farmers you know um, Right, you, we've got to be more strategic. And uh, that's when my hope is with Bobby Kennedy. And I, I was, I, you know, it's been interesting with these vaccines, they're like, like this, there's evidence, but public opinion, maybe five in the North, the liberals don't public opinion that doesn't, you know, just hates me because I, 
I'm like, it really is killing people, but I can't get the message to anybody. And, and so I actually am working with this guy, um, Steve Kirsch and Substack, where we're allowed to publish freely. And we're, they're going to be a debate, you know, is it good or not good? And we've got to get it at the congressional level. There's got to be just one set of truth here. And uh, we find ourselves kind of back, you know, am I wrong? I don't understand physics or history or, you know, nuclear power. But uh, we, we assume that there are experts who do. And uh, uh, we, we need to have those people in the business on the inside, you know, um, actually that's why I'm running with Robert Kennedy. I'm determined I'm gonna, and we've got to bring, everybody's got to work together. We've got to organize, you know, around environment, around this truth and, and education and get this into curriculum. There's just one set of truth, the highest, and you know, stop the deniers. And also the big idea last is that there was a Gillette Amendment 1913 that says, the government, the president doesn't get to make do public relations because it leads to an abuse of power. And we're seeing that that happens on both sides. It's just a complete misinformation of the people and it's it's gotta stop, so thank you. Okay, Charlie, go ahead. All right, I'd like to thank uh, Richard and Stephanie for a nice presentation on the Earth Bill, thank you. And I hope everyone will contact their congressman and join the Earthville, Illinois team to get passage of this important piece of legislation. I'll be eclectic as usual. I have six matters I would like to talk about. And before that, I just want to say, uh, under no circumstances, do we want Ellen and her friends to be gain a foothold in the curriculum of our schools with some of the disinformation that they wish to spread in our society because it's it's been found unacceptable, unacceptable to normal media outlets and the disparate treatment. Well, there's a reason why. All right, number one, I've been over some of these several times. I don't know how many times I've counted, at least a dozen new thorium reactors are coming online next week. And, every week, and they don't come online. And also, Tim, the reason they're building one possibly in the remote desert of China is because thorium reactors use apparently less water. You weren't aware of that. Yeah, uh, number two, I've heard over and over again that the, the thorium reactor ran successfully for thousands of days, thousands years of in Tennessee. And then at the same time, I'm told that China assigned 600 engineers to design a thorium reactor. Why do you need to design 600 uh, engineers to design something which is proven? But there seem, you have to avoid internal contradictions, pal. Number three, the, there's a mythology that thorium is somehow different from other nuclear technology. It is not according to what I read. The thorium aspect of it is simply a different method of getting the reaction, the technology moving. And from then on, we're talking same old fashioned nuke stuff that's been around and just as dangerous. And this is the same as the type that have cause unfortunate accidents. So there you look at one and it's the same thing. Seeing one, you see them all. All right, number uh, four. Uh, mm -hmm. the, uh, hey, you can make any kind of claim you want about something that doesn't exist. And these guys do this all the time. It's a mythical machine. It does this and that. And yes, and yes, da, 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 da. endlessly make a long list of what it does and doesn't do. And no one can refute it because it doesn't exist. <laughs> you can't prove it well, but you go on and on making assertions and claims as to this machine, which doesn't exist, which is amazing. Um, 
Uh, Andy hit on it. The technology to build one of these is around 10 years. Hey, we're talking about a pretty complex piece of machinery here to maintain that nothing will go wrong with something. That, that has to be the most complex device ever devised by mankind, easily. And to maintain that this thing will function somehow perfectly forever uh, is, is simply a claim that doesn't deserve an answer uh, in any fashion whatsoever. Uh, also, uh, I think the first time they turn on, if they do ever get around to building one of them, uh, I don't know, why don't you invite your family and you can go out there to witness when they turn it on. It's it on perfectly. Bring your family, you can have a picnic <laughs> outside of it and watch it turn on and cheer or something like that. Uh, number five, regarding uh, Anna, I totally concur with her. There should be public ownership of the utilities, the energy production of the United States, among other industries. Uh, I'm a socialist. I'm always amazed. I write checks as paying bills, and I pay to the People's Gas and the Commonwealth Edison. And I go, well, if it's the People's Gas, what do I have to pay for it? Yeah. There are utilities that are publicly owned. I believe the city of Cleveland has been generating their own uh, gas and natural gas system. I've not researched the topic, but if they are public utilities, they in fact should in fact be public utilities and become agencies of the local municipal government. Um, yeah, and of all, Ernie says, we should reduce the number of children. We're gonna hear about Tim on April the 29th. Yes. Um, I was reading today, you can get a robotic wife. Uh, you can design her. So maybe that'd be better than having a regular wife, you know, nagging you. Mm -hmm. So you could program her not to be a pain in the neck, something like that. And, you know, I, I don't know, uh, but there may be a, a supplement or uh, some are a replacement for natural nuclear families and things like that. All right. Thank you very much, everyone, for coming out. I think I, we've advanced the state of the art. Thank you. Okay. Our, uh, Meryl, if you want a little, contribute a little bit for the last word, no more than about two to three minutes. No, then... thank you. Well, I'll say something about this Earth um, X to stop climate um, pollution by 2030. It advocates um, having um, renewable sources of energy <laughs> on the um, electric grid and to have only electric cars manufactured in the United States and then um, regenerative agriculture by uh, large farms that are owned by um, <clears throat> corporations. And um, this will bring down the electric quite, a, uh, the, the carbon emissions quite a bit, like 40%, 60% down to 40%. Um, <clears throat> it's currently in the uh, Rep House of Representatives. Um, Illinois doesn't have a sponsor. We're trying to work with um, Jan Sikowski and Lauren Underwood. Um, if anyone has um, any relation, oh, I think there's a few other people, um, Mike Quigley and um, Kaysen, who, who people are have been trying to talk to. So call whoever your, um, your representative is and tell them that you think they should work hard for it. It's, um, there's a, I'm sure there's a lot of problems with all the types of electricity, but at least um, uh, solar and wind and um, tidal and um, thermal and hydro um, le electricity do not cause major pollution or are a risk to our health, like um, nuclear or um, the fossil fuels.
So it would be good if we could rely on alternative sources of energy. Thank you. Okay, Richard, you get your last word. You've got five minutes. Um, talk away and we'll keep you, uh, we'll adjourn after you're done. Okay, well, I want to first of all thank the college very much, Charlie, everybody else here. It's great to see you all. I've been a long time looking at this through Zoom, and now it's nice to see you all in, in uh, some familiar faces in person. So that's good to be back. Um, I think that we've, we've covered an enormously complicated subject here. There's not a, no simple solution to this. It can be a combination of individuals doing what they can do best. There's all sorts of things we can do personally not to make things worse. I mean, more kids for me, but uh, <laughs> uh, you know, talk to my daughter about that. Half well. a million apiece. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it, won't, it can't be done by individuals alone just doing what they do best. It's too big a problem for that. We've got to get work on our legislators and get them to do the right thing or vote the bastards out if they don't do the right thing because we don't have time. This is an urgent matter. The time is of the urgency, is the essence, which is why things like the Earth Bill recognize the urgency of this and do something about it. There's a lot of wonderful ideas about what you can do. You know, we're working hard on nuclear fusion, which is maybe 30 years away. It always has been 30 years away. <laughs> it may happen, maybe getting, getting closer and closer. We can't depend upon it. And who knows about thorium reactors? Somewhat the same. I mean, the, the big thing to look at here is opportunity cost. Every year you depend upon uh, the future coming along with um, a new wonderful solution. You're wasting time to use what you've already got. And we don't have time, therefore, we have to depend upon the things that we know work. And we have those things. And you may not all agree on whether they will do the whole problem. There's a certain lot more than we can do than we're doing at present. So let's all try and work really hard to push our legislators and others to do the right thing. They probably know what it is, but they're scared of doing it or they don't think it's important enough to do it. But we can make we can change that by working hard on it. So thank you all very much for being here. Great evening. I really enjoy talking to you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. That's a wrap. All right, I'd like to thank uh, Charlie for the acquisition of a new microphone to help us on the Zoom. And uh, thank you for everybody for coming tonight. We appreciate your stuff. I'm glad we're seeing we're getting our in-person crowd back as well as our Zoom. With that, the College of Complexes is adjourned. All right, that was a good one. Everyone enjoy it? Yeah, I did. That's good. Yeah. They want us to build nukes with public ownership. <laughs>